G'day and welcome to Amazing Applications. My name is Neil Benson. I'm the founder of Customary and your host for the Amazing Applications show. Amazing Applications is here to help Microsoft customers and partners build amazing Dynamics 365 and Power Platform applications, especially those using agile approaches. If you enjoy the show, visit amazingapps.show to subscribe to our newsletter. You'll get notified of new episodes. You can leave a review. You can leave me a voicemail with your questions for a future episode. You'll also find transcripts for today's episode, along with show notes and links to the resources mentioned in this episode and all the others. It's amazingapps.show. Today, I'm joined by Emma Beckett. Emma is the founder of Fortitude 17, an application testing consultancy in the UK. Emma has a background as a test analyst testing Dynamics ERP applications, but she's also a professional footballer, which is a first for this podcast. This is episode 237. You'll find show notes at amazingapps.show slash 237. Here's Emma. I'm delighted to welcome on to the Amazing Applications podcast today, Emma Beckett. Emma is from London in the UK, and she is a contribute test professional and uh, the owner of her own business, Fortitude 17. Welcome to the Amazing Apps podcast, Emma. Thanks so much, Neil. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show. I, I've been following some of your content on LinkedIn for a little while, and I'm always intrigued by um, testers and their approach to our business applications projects. And in fact, a couple of the I'm not a test expert, as you, you'll probably find out during the course of this, this discussion, but um, the kind of testing articles that I've written or the shows that I've had in the past have been really popular. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of demand for improving our ability to improve the quality of our software. So I'm really excited to dive into today's conversation with you. Great. Yeah, I, I did go through and, and listen to the Test in Heaven podcast that you did. Um, so being <laughs> was, prepared, yeah. I'm going to come back at you with some questions. I'm really interested yeah. to hear about the agile oh. side of things. Oh, I'm going to get put on the spot here. Yeah, that was one of the most uh, popular episodes from last year. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to <laughs> happy to get grilled on that. Uh, let's let's start with an introduction. Can you give us your backstory and, and how you came to build your own testing consultancy? I'm fascinated to know your backstory. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, long story short, my best friend growing up, she did exceptionally well uh, for herself. Carved out a career in testing. Started, I think, seconding as a test analyst at Volkswagen, it would have been, um, went on and, and has now got a great reputation in the testing world. Um, director of testing, heads up, um, huge teams now. And yeah, I kind of thought to myself, I, I quite like a slice of that pie. So for me, I, I was actually at the Open University um, during this time and I um, spent a, a little bit of time kind of between careers, not really sure where I wanted to go with things. Um, I'd, I'd reached out to to my friend and said, look, any tips or tricks? And, and she said, look, employers are really hot on the ISTQB qualification. Go and have a look at it. Um, so I went away. I bought a book, self-taught, uh, managed to pass the exam. Um, probably more luck than judgment at that point. Um, I guess, yeah. but, but at the Open University, I kind of tried to progress and asked around and, you know, your kind of end of year appraisals. I asked if there's any chance that I can... Um, you know, took on my own way onto um, onto such a role, and um, unfortunately, it didn't quite come about. But to progress my career, I kind of decided that I'm going to have to leave this company that I've grown to love. I'd been there for um, a number of years at this point, had some really good friends. That you know, it's one of these jobs where the perks were fabulous. We worked on a great campus, you know, yeah. all this good stuff. Um, and anyway, the, as luck would have it, I decided um, to to kind of start reaching out, put my CV about, and um, a test academy was launched within the Open University and there was a space right. for five. Yeah, right. Uh, so there was a space for five um, trainee roles. Um, I was lucky enough to grab one of them after fulfilling a number of aptitude tests and interviews. Um, I was actually only in the role for six months. So um, kind of like I've done with my team now, um, anyone that's kind of new to testing, we go through um, a rigorous training regime to, to kind of bring people up to skill, particularly if people have transitioned from um, a non-testing uh, role right. and um, and I instead of being in there for the whole year I, I was in there for six months and I, I kind of got itchy feet um, and I left a contract so I as a, as a new kid on the block decided um, to move from the the trainee role that I was into contracting um, people right. probably thinking that I'm 
mad and a little bit of a cowboy and I, I probably was a little <laughs> bit of both at that point. Um, a six but... months experience and a certification <laughs> under your belt. Well, that's it. I'd, I'd, I'd worked in de- desktop support um, just before that. Um, I'd done a lot of self-teaching, self-reading on it. And I know experience is very much one thing. I certainly had the theory to, to a great extent, you know, under my right. belt. But yeah, in terms of experience, I was severely lacking. Um, I managed to get a contract straight away. I remember going to my parents, whom I was still living with at the time, and I said, Mum, Dad, I've I've decided I'm going to go, you know, break out on my own. And coming from a Mancunian working class background, it was... Uh, it was quite a conversation, but I, I'm very lucky with my folks. And anyway, they they kind of championed it and said, look, if this is what you want to do, then here we are. We support you. And as you know, with contracting, you know, recruitment agents will only kind of touch you with a two week notice period or so. So yeah. I, um, I I kind of handed my notice in with nothing to go to. And I, I ended uh, my uh, sorry my employment at the OU on the Friday and started my contract on the Monday. So oh, I was very, very, yeah, thank you very much. I was very fortunate, as I said, more luck than judgment. But um, I was in that role for kind of, uh, I think about 15 months and then it kind of went from contract to contract and project to project. And yeah, from, from that moment on, from my first contract, I'd had a limited company. Um, my plan was to always expand and grow um, once I kind of felt comfortable enough to do so and, and kind of knew the direction I wanted to take the recruit, uh, sorry, to take my consultancy. Um, yeah. And yeah, here we are today. Uh, that's, that's an amazing story. I really, um, I, I've been a contractor in the UK and a lot of contractors will start their own limited company, much more popular in Australia than it is here in, sorry, in the UK than it is here in Australia. Mm-hmm. Some uh, UK contractors will use umbrella companies and other things set up by agencies or accountancies. Um, but you, you had that vision from, from the very early days that it wasn't going to be just you. It wasn't going to be a freelance business. You were go- hoping to grow it into something more substantial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I, I've always been one of these people that, that like to trailblaze. I like to beat my own path. Um, the, the term or the, the, the term I kind of coined is shepherd, not a sheep. Um, yep. And that's that's kind of how I, I've sadly always been uh, for good, for bad. No one knows, but uh, that's the way I am. And uh, yeah, I decided that, you know, it, it just so happened that I'd be in a, a permanent role for two years and um, it it became unfulfilling to that point. You know, I, I kind of, probably like most people, you get to a point and you've kind of milked everything you can in terms of, you know, knowledge and experience out of that role. And you want something else, something else that's fulfilling. And for me, I just kind of knew probably from a kid, like pre-teenage that I wanted to, to venture out on my own someday. Yeah. And tell me about some of the Microsoft dynamics or power platform projects that you've been a part of and, and, you know, the testing regime on uh i'd love to know more about uh, some successes you've had there and any any stories you can share about what to do or what not to do <laughs> success is a bold word uh, maybe i'll come to you <laughs> for success um but in terms of my experience uh, my very first contract the one i kind of aforementioned was an ax 2012 role right. um it wasn't quite testing it as as i know the job to be now it was more kind of a test support role there was kind of you know, analysis work to be done within it, you know, the, the, the atypical testing role. Right. But um, but now it's, uh, yeah, I'm much happier with D365 and, and that kind of stack. You know, <laughs> AX2012 was retired for a reason, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, that product's been around for a long time. In fact, there's still um, one of my customers here in Brisbane's replacing it soon. In fact, mm-hmm. two, two of them are. So it's, yeah, about 10 years old now, at least. That's some it. So talk to me about, um, sorry, Neil, talk to me about some of your successes. Well, in terms of uh, t- testing in particular, mm-hmm. I think my teams are big fans of adopting an agile approach. And the testers that I've brought into those Scrum teams quite often haven't worked in Scrum before. In fact, I don't think any of them have. And they're they're shocked at, first of all, how early they're involved in the project. Like they're, they're there during the discovery phase. Mm-hmm. During the discovery, we're uncovering the requirements. Uh, but we're also setting up our test strategy, setting up our test plan. And I want the um, test professionals to be involved in estimating the size of the stories because there are so many times when uh, developers and, and app makers think it's a small, simple requirement. But if you've got a background in testing, you go, actually, there's a lot of negative testing to do, or there's a whole bunch of t- test cases and test scenarios we need to imagine and write out and, and test against. In particular, you know, data migration work or um, security role testing. 
every time there's a permission given, you have to test that all the other permissions are not given. Uh, so, you know, things like that we, f we found uh, testers give us a great insight into. Uh, and then we another little practice we have is this, um, when we start working on a new story, so it might be early in the sprint, we've laid out our sprint backlog with uh, 20 or 30 stories in it. And as we start to develop the story, we'll get together in a little huddle called the Three Amigos. So it'll be the business analyst or the product owner, whoever knows most about the requirement, the developer or the developers might be a couple of people who are going to work on it and build it. And then the tester who's probably going to be testing it. And they just get together to, to you know, confirm their approach. How are they going to build it? How are they going to test it? Who's mm -hmm. going to test it? When's it going to be ready? What's the time look like during the course of the sprint? And that works really well. It just kicks off that little communication cycle. And so everybody's clear about what they're doing, when it's going to be done, mm -hmm. how it's going to be validated. Um, um, yeah. So what are the other things? Um, I, I'm sure you're going to shoot me down and go, oh, that's a really silly idea. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, no, and then no. um, I guess the, the final piece for me is, um, our testers are wonderful, but they don't have the final say that this thing is good enough mm -hmm. or valuable enough. That's really up to the product owner or mm -hmm. our other stakeholders who we ask to validate um, the feature before we declare ourselves done. So testing just says, yeah, it conforms to the requirement and it, it looks really good and it, it mm -hmm. does what it says and it, it behaves appropriately. But is it valuable? Is it something they really want to use? Is it spelled correctly? Is it you know in the right place? Uh, we still have the final the user doing the final verification. I don't know if your experience has been similar or, or different in some of your projects. Um, very good question. Um, actually, rule of thumb, you know, I, I very much agree with what you said. I, I think for me, um, testing is everyone's responsibility. And I think the most successful projects or teams that I've been a part of, um, testing are onboarded very early. Um, as you know, as well as I do, testing in the, if you talk about the whole holistic life cycle, we're right yeah. at the very end. So in terms of where we're onboarded, um, I've had experience of working with some PMs that actually decide to bring us in, you know, post development, you know, and that way yeah. you, you kind of, yeah, it, for me, it's very, very late in the day. Um, you obviously kind of work probably more to a risk-based approach because you're kind of late into the requirements. You don't have visibility of kind of what's gone in before, you know, you're reading yeah, yeah. probably historical documents at this point, um, you know, baselined at best. Um, but for me, the best and most successful projects I've been in is, is where testing has been kind of kicked off at conception. Um, so the, the two projects my team is currently delivering at the moment, the testers are part of our team. So they're employed by, by my consultancy, Superware. Mm -hmm. um, in other big projects I've run, uh, University of New South Wales and at uh, KPMG, uh, sorry, at um, RECQ, I was working for a Microsoft consultancy and the customer had hired a third party testing consultancy. Mm -hmm. And initially I was uh, a little wary, a little reluctant to, to work with them, but actually it worked out really well. I loved having a third party who was independent from my team and um, testing the quality of our work. And you know, we worked really well together. Um, mm -hmm. There was never a them and us, but there was that little bit of attention, a little bit of friction that I think uh, held us to account really well. Do you find that working with Microsoft partners, are they initially wary and do you eventually win them over? Um, I'd like to think so. We're, we're certainly the elephant in the room. You know, it's um, <laughs> it comes with the territory. Um, you know, essentially when people outside of testing or outside of tech ask what I do, I, you know, in a nutshell, my response is, I, I'm paid to critique someone else's work, you know, and it, and it sounds like such a get out of jail card. Um, it probably <laughs> is. But, I, I play football and I've grown up in teams. And for me, you know, the, there are ways to talk to people that not everyone is going to respond in the same way. And people are going to be sensitive. You know, it is their work and very, you know, very understandable. If someone critiques me for a pass I play in football, you know, I'm probably going to, you know, turn around and give them a bit of a look, but it's the same with <laughs> the same with tech, you know, it's, um, it's quite translating in such a way. Um, yeah. I think for me, I love kind of being brought in the buzzword you said is independent you know, our job is not really to kind of hot anyone up or, or call out any mistakes. You know, it's it's really the common goal between all parties. And, and I'm talking about all partners. I'm talking about, you know, BAs, PM, testing, development. Everyone has the same consensus, and that is to deliver quality software. Our job is to really, you know, we, we do hold people accountable, I guess you can say that. But again, it's, it's never personal. It's always you know, our, our job is to really uphold reputation by delivering to the client as best as we can. Um, do your teams ever get hired by a Microsoft partner or is it nearly always the end customer 
who's engaging with you and asking you to to be involved in the project? Um, honestly, we work across both both spectrums. There, yeah. um, we work and have collaborations with partners. The the best way about that is that when we go on site with a customer or a client, provisional client. Um, we've already had discussions about processes and we've kind of underlaid them. So we're not going in day one trying to, you know, beat a path of quality or, you know, in terms of how do we go about defect hang- handover? It's none of that. It's, we've, we've already got those processes established early doors. Um, when we work with clients, so when we go kind of B2B, we work in a, a, a similar but different way. You know, it's not for us to dictate. I, as I said earlier, quality is everyone's responsibility in my book. Um, we certainly guide and handhold, but as, as you said, as you rightly said before, in my opinion, in our opinion, um, when it comes to quality, it's not testers that have the final say, it's actually down to the product owners, it's down to the stakeholders within the business. You know, is this good enough? Yes or no, it's on, the, on their terms. Yeah. Um, interested in in you talked earlier on about bringing on new testers into your team and, and training them what are the qualities that you think make for good test professionals and what additional training do you typically give somebody joining your team sure uh, really good question i think for me um i don't think there's an atypical template or fit that i look for when hiring for example for me there are some skills that are, I, I would like to kind of find in every tester and those are attention for detail, patience. And um, if, if you ask me any of my friends, I'll say that's really an ironic statement. Um, <laughs> oh, God, dear. Um, but actually, you know, for me, it's, it's both of those things. I think everything else can be taught. You know, um, I'm sure you've had conversations with people or have you used this particular solution? Well, no, I've used a kind of prehistoric version and it's like, oh, well, you know, you haven't actually got experience with this. But with testers, you know, the good ones, they should be able to take any system and interrogate it in a similar, honest and independent way. Um, The the kind of training that we offer my team is we have access to DevOps, we have access to a live FNO environment, um, and we um, are working through things like Microsoft Learn, the pathways there. We work through, in a similar way, BC, uh, Business Central. Um, And again, we have recently um, started working and partnered with a a, a company that offers a very good automation test tool. Um, I can't share too much on that just yet because it's not been announced um, by 4217, but um, breaking news. They're they're actually one of the few automation pieces that can stretch across all Microsoft solution. So we are working with them to deliver and deliver a great quality of um, automation testing you know particularly around regression and things like that um so we spent a lot of time um branching out so my team don't kind of follow one particular template we do what i would class as the basics or the standard we have all the essential training that i've just kind of mentioned there um but one of my team who has come from again a a pro athlete she is she's now retired um and studying a a degree uh, simultaneously she's actually writing a dissertation as we speak um <laughs> she is um now the kind of lead on tech so she has fallen completely in with selenium she is looking after um the, the test tool the implementation test tool right. and she's looking after the automated training software that we have too so yeah she's the one that's loading the the github pipelines she's she's actually done incredibly well and, and yeah, very good yeah. I, th- I think you're right there's a there's an element there of um you know, you don't have to know the entire stack, but you have to be great at learning new technologies, whether it's a new application you're going to be testing or new tools you're going to be testing with uh, or new approaches. Um, that ability to, to not be afraid to pick something up and to grab it and dive into it. I think it's essential for a lot of us in our jobs today, um, uh, testers included. And uh, when it comes to automation, there's, I think the, the pace of change there is probably the, the fastest. There's a new tools every couple of months and we're using new approaches microsoft's come out with um a test test engine for canvas apps today which i haven't I haven't explored at all looking forward to, yeah. to finding out more about that one um and we got uh, tools like easy repro and, and lots of third party um things as well so it's just mm-hmm. so much to keep abreast of um and that's just when it comes to kind of the functional testing stuff when it comes to mm-hmm. you know, performance testing and load testing there's there's different tools again so you really have to be adaptable and and pick things up quickly yeah you know an awful lot on testing it seems yeah I um, am uh, <laughs> trying to keep up with my team you know very good obviously um 
in, in your test in heaven podcast you made a really interesting point about qa professionals writing the best test cases i hope you don't mind me kind of putting you on the spot with this question but coming from someone that coordinates and leads a team it's great to have you know the value that and the the opinion that testers bring so much value to to a project and and have that actually acknowledged so thank you for that on behalf of testers <laughs> um in my opinion in my opinion, testers clearly have um, a trained method of approaching certain testing scenarios. Um, however, what we achieve as test folk is really underpinned by the knowledge of SMEs and, and CEs and BA, uh, sorry, uh, functional consultants and BAs yeah. and what they hold in terms of knowledge around the system and how best to kind of form it, help us formulate tests. Do you, do you agree with that or do you, do you find, um, I'm just interested to kind of get to the bottom of your point. Do you think it's a real standalone thing for testers or do you think there's more value when it's a collaborative approach? Um, definitely a, a collaborative approach. And um, when it comes to the, uh, the relationship between a tester and the, the SMEs, the subject matter experts that are typically experienced users in our business units, I love it when um, the testers join my team and said, oh, you know, I used to work in a contact center mm -hmm. or I used to, you know, I was a sales analyst uh, uh, way back when, when they have that real business experience and they've, they've come into testing uh, and there's lots of roles in the business applications industry and people go, oh, I just fell into this. It wasn't, you know, wasn't my ambition when I was studying you know, third year English at high school to become a, a software tester. Um, but when, when they find their, their home as a, a quality professional, I love it when they have that background uh, or, or have a mixed background of having worked in other industries and other other roles, because you can just bring that different perspective as a user, what frustrates me when I'm trying to export things to Excel and the date format is stuffed up. Mm -hmm. you know, the, um, people with who've come from, let's say a developer or a, a business analyst into a testing role, they have quite a technical perspective and uh, that empathy with our users is sometimes not quite there. Mm -hmm. So I think if you have a test professional with that kind of mixed background, and they're getting out there and they're talking to the, the, the users and the subject matter experts and working within the team. Like that, that seems to work really well for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You, you kind of touched on something there that's, that's actually why we offer training services as a group now, uh, as a company, because there is such a close parallel between testing and, and, and essentially training. You know, we spend so much time with the users. As you say, we, you know, there is a, a certain level of empathy you kind of um, take on board, um, you know, you know, speaking kind of openly with test folk, we are often the people that kind of take um, technical information from developers and BAs and, you know, functional consultants, and we relay it to users in a, in a sensical way, a way that actually resonates with them. So for us, it was a natural segue, probably based on the empathy we kind of encounter yeah. having such close relationship with the end user. Um, talking about testing and the relationship between testing and training, I think one thing I need to improve on is when we ask our users to do acceptance testing, and I'd love if the users would do acceptance testing with us every sprint. So we've got a 10-day um, sprint. We're hoping to be you know, releasing finished features pretty early in the sprint, at least halfway through. Some features should be finished, the little, mm -hmm. little ones. The bigger ones might be finished towards the end. But please you know, test them and, and validate them. Uh, as, as quickly as we can develop them. But I don't think I've done a good enough job or my, our teams have done a good enough job of training our users how to do acceptance testing mm -hmm. and just th throwing them a feature with a, a system test case isn't really very fair, I don't think. Um, but this is also, it's going to take six, nine, 12 months of application development. The users are going to have to be in this for the long haul and they're going to see a lot of features with rough edges and uh, there's a lot of optimization yet to do. What approaches have you seen to acceptance testing that have worked well, especially you know projects where the acceptance testing is not just a big lump of deferred activity at the end of mm -hmm. the project, mm -hmm. where it's an integral part of the development process? Um, I'm missing a trick here. I'd love to get your, your advice <laughs> and expertise. Well, I, I think you've been a bit cruel, but um, yeah, I'll certainly chip in. Um, so I think in my experience, the, the more successful projects and outcomes in terms of um, user engagement, certainly when it comes to acceptance testing, is um, the same with testing, as you mentioned. The earlier they're onboarded, the better. Um, that's certainly how, how I found it true to be. Um, the way that I like to work, I mean, coming purely from a test, you know, from someone that, that coordinates such a, um, acceptance testing, 
I love to work with the user and I love to get to know them on a kind of human level. And, you know, as it, as it kind of transpires, you'll get people that are kind of stronger within the group, people that are kind of named as SMEs or super users, as we kind of tend yep. to call them in, in my projects, at least. And the idea being that you champion those, you empower them and you appreciate that when the time comes, when the system's live, the chances are these super users are going to be the ones that people turn to, that people want. Um, extra right. guidance from and a little bit more support. Yeah, I would say in terms of, you know, project management engagement, the sooner the better, um, you know, and kind of identify early doors who who might those users be. You know, for me, I work with key stakeholders, whether it's an IT systems manager or someone that that kind of works closely with the business, but from a technical endpoint. Um, and they can kind of marry up, you know, the successes there. Um, one thing we've actually we offer as a company and this isn't (laughs) a selling opportunity it's just very topical we offer um workshops so funny enough um tomorrow i'm actually delivering a three-day workshop with an end client and it's really focused around acceptance testing so the things we'll cover are things like what a test plan looks like and and this particular client isn't dedicating budget towards testing so they're all they're doing it in-house hence the the workshop so I'll, I'll be there to kind of talk through, you know, how to kind of formulate a strategy in, in a kind of um, basic non-technical approach and what designing your test plans look like and how you include data, you know, how you kind of think of different nuances and how you kind of structure and pin all that together, um, you know, entry and exit criteria. So we talk through um, a lot of these things. And again, it's really just about empowering. Um, one of the things I like to do and as a company, we, you know, it's something we kind of be into ourselves you know from top to bottom is to be able to conversate with people in a way that makes sense you know um the example i use is that someone in hr doesn't care about you know my risk-based strategy you know (laughs) we need to deliver it in a way that actually they want to hear you know i'm sure that you can attest to most projects or a lot of projects you've been into the end users you know don't really want the change they kind of know that you know, I'm, I'm quite settled in my job. Maybe I can come in and not have to think about it. I can just go through the motions, you know, which is like any of us on a good or a bad day. But, the same, right. you know, when it comes to actually evolving the system, you know, my job and something that I kind of I love to kind of <clears throat> explore and, and kind of put across is that actually, whilst I'm not your line manager, like there is so much value in your participation here you may not see it in this instance and i can completely concur that you don't want to do acceptance testing when you've got you know eight hours of your normal day to do too Um, however it really is for your benefit in the long run yeah i think there's something to be said there for trying to allocate somebody's time as an acceptance tester and i quite often challenge um, managers to say look can we can we free up some of fred's time or some of susie's time to to sit and work with us during the course of, of the sprint. So every two weeks, if we can just have them for um, a Thursday afternoon, you know, the, the first and second Thursday afternoons of our sprint, that would be great. And we can sit beside them, show them the, the functionality, demonstrate it to them, ask them to run through a couple of scenarios uh, and give us their feedback. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we're going to capture their observations and their thoughts and any bugs that they find. Um, and what we love to do is to try and jump on those things quite quickly within the sprint if we can and just fix them straight away so the person can see oh my, my feedback is actually having an impact on the quality of the application that they're building that's awesome um, other times where it's maybe a bigger issue or we haven't quite got a business process quite right or something like that then we'll, we'll take mm-hmm. it back we need to consult with some people but i think showing them the, the value of their contribution early and often is pretty important as well yeah yeah, I, I think you're so spot on. Like everything you kind of mentioned there from from the agile approach to how quickly people are onboarded. If you can replicate that and have the SMEs or end users or super users, whichever you know term we use, I, I yeah, it only bodes well, I think. Switching back to some of the other forms of, of testing on, on projects, so as well as the kind of functional testing and maybe some integration testing, if there's going to be uh, systems that are integrated with our, our Microsoft application, how hot are your customers on things like performance testing and, and load testing and even security and penetration testing? Do those things come up in, in your projects or those services that, that you offer? Um, because I, I sometimes 
I've just got a couple of clients who think, that, oh, performance testing is Microsoft's problem. It's all hosted in on their cloud. They'll deal with it. Um, do, you, do you have customers who take that approach or something a bit? I don't oh, know. It's, it's very it's... interesting. Um, I thought that, you know, the Microsoft responsible for uh, performance testing was only a European thing, but um, <laughs> good to know it stretches as far as Australia. Um, it's a very good question. In terms of security testing, that's something we very much do in-house. And I talk particularly right. around the roles and security matrix and making sure that you mentioned negative testing quite early on. Gosh, um, the security and negative testing is such a huge thing. You know, um, I worked on, a, you know, quite recently, a, a three-year HR project. And if you can imagine people being able to access sensitive data, right. um, my gosh, you know, it's it, testing's on the hook, you know, my team would yep. be on the hook. Um, so in terms of security, gosh, that is a huge risk in any project and something that, you know, in I talked about risk-based approach, that is something that's up there, um, up and amongst it for me. In terms of performance, it's a real good question. I know a lot of um, clients and projects that I've worked with in, they do rely on Microsoft for that. There are tools, you know, that you can use for, for performance testing in particular load, but you kind of, it's, it's difficult. With the Microsoft stack, you're, you're kind of limited, you know, in terms of automation, as we spoke about earlier, for example, RSAT was the original test tool and that wasn't, you know, that's not something you can use across every solution in the stack. Right. So it is difficult to find a tool that actually fulfills the need. Um, I think if, I'll be honest, if, if certain clients have um, a serious demand or, you know, a business requirement that, that kind of really does require um, levels of kind of pen testing, you know, penetration testing, then I, I would outsource, you know, I'd rather kind of make sure that I advised adequately than got it wrong. Yeah, yeah. my gosh. With testing, I don't think, I don't think you can kind of necessarily take those risks. Certainly not not on behalf of a business, no chance. Yeah, so I think, um, speaking of a, a risk-based approach, we, we will advise on doing third-party penetration testing anytime there's a portal involved, anytime there's mm -hmm. any kind of external access mm -hmm. um, being provided. Um, when it's purely an internal application, we might take a lighter touch um, mm -hmm. to that. Um, when it comes to performance, I do like to test our APIs and make sure anything that we've built um, okay. is able to handle the load that we're going to throw at it. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the Microsoft APIs, um, one person's performance test is another person's denial of service attack. You have to be a little bit careful. Um, and uh, I know that um, particularly some enterprise customers will work pretty closely with Microsoft, maybe through mm -hmm. the fast track program to say, hey, on this date at time, we're going to be doing some um, performance testing just to let you know and you know they'll, they'll make arrangements with microsoft so that everybody's uh, aware of what's going on uh, that seems to work best yeah that's uh, that's a great kind of point you brought up um something i like to um encourage during and, and facilitate during a uat cycle for example is such a such an event um so for example I, i'll kind of use the the hr project i mentioned we had people from buenos aires and the americas all the way through to beijing and, you know, we had every, I think between between those two kind of prime locations, we'll say, we had a hundred of us dotted, you know, sporadically, you know, throughout the continent. And one thing that we kind of said is, look, if you want to replicate, you know, with considerations, all localizations, um, load on the system, replicate something, it's actually going to be, you know, quite realistic um, for the business when this is live then what we can do is everyone kind of facilitate their own roles. So we have tests that are set up and aligned with a user's particular security role, what they would actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, at the rates that they would tend to kind of see per day. And right. we would get everyone to kind of um, hit the system within that two hours window, for example. And Microsoft, as per the fast track program, would monitor that. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of one thing I would say has been quite beneficial, um, certainly for me as a test manager, is because you kind of get real life situations occurring. Um, yeah, yeah I, I would say that's kind of one of the best ways. Um, I mean, gosh, if you know any particular Microsoft uh, load testing tools or performance testing tools, I'm all ears. Um, <laughs> that, hence why no, we've kind of I... branched out to, uh, to other automation tools. Yeah, I, I wish I had a magic solution, but um, like you say, it's it's rapidly evolving. There's always new tools coming to market and, and people trying to help us solve that approach, um, mm -hmm. which is which is great. You mentioned uh, getting lots of users around the world to you know, simulate their, their daily 
activity and, and try and uh, make sure the system's going to stand up. Do you see a lot of issues with um, things like browsers or, or different um, locales when it comes to like, especially when we're doing um, testing of, of public applications rather than an internal employee um, focused application? Mm -hmm. um, the, the people, you know, the general public who might inter uh, use our, our, our application through a portal, through some kind of native device um, app, we, we can't govern what version of Android they've got or how old their iPhone is or the fact that they want to run a, an iPad in tablet mode or sorry, in portrait mode versus landscape. Do you come across a lot of those kind of issues or because we're building business apps, is it mostly for employees where we've got more control over the devices and, and uh, browsers that we're using? Very good question. I think for me, certainly the projects I've been on have very much been employee in-house. So in terms of governance and what versions can be controlled and things like that, it's very much an IT policy-wide um, global right. approach. So um, we we have had people, um, for example, with part of UAT try and um, fulfill the test role, uh, sorry, the testing roles on on handheld devices. So I, right. I, I don't even mean I you know, iPads, I'm talking about phones or Android phones and, you know, gosh, that creates its own difficulty. You know, it's a, it's, you know, in a backwards way, it was quite a good test because you kind of find out quite quickly what you can and can't do. Yeah. Um, and if there's any access problems and, you know, kind of, it sounds crazy, but like the more simplistic backdoor things, you know, sometimes the, the most obvious bug is the one that you miss, you know, because you're kind of thinking of all these kind of strange, funny permutations and, you know, your negative testing and, and taking an outside of the box approach, you know, and sometimes it's actually right in front of your eyes. So yeah, sometimes it does kind of pose a, a good challenge. Um, but I mean, in terms of bandwidth and, and what's kind of best to use with dynamics you know the browser i kind of promote the most and i'm not sure if i'm allowed to is is chrome you know that's kind of the best results i've seen whenever i kind of take an approach to testing it's, it's a bit of a cheat actually of mine but i have this thing that i call a, a run book and it it's like um it's like a, a tester's project plan that's what i'll call it so it's it's kind of got a lot of linear and chronological um activities that i would tend to do there um it's obviously bespoke and changed for every project that i do um, but in terms of things to consider, I have the run book, as I call it, and I also have a lesson learned book. So within the lessons learned, it's things like um, when you're sending out um, engagement for acceptance testing, does it include we're going to use this browser? We're going to focus on these times. We're going right. to do this, that and the other, you know, um, and it's just really a refinement of sorts, you know, as, as you kind of move through project to project, um, it's making sure that. I'm on top of things as best as I can be. It's making sure that my team have a uniform approach. So everything we do is structured and it's not just kind of me and a head full of magic. It's actually something that we <laughs> you know, promote as a team. That's good. Like, sounds like you've just taken some time and effort to document your best practices and, and build those into you know, a way of working that you can train your team upon and, and uh, help mm -hmm. your, your clients benefit from. Yeah. Um, I think with, with testing in particular, it's, um, Gosh, you know, when you're the one that's critiquing everyone, you kind of need to make sure you're you're double checking your work at least twice. Um, it's, <laughs> and and again, it's not not because we're faultless. Again, but if you're kind of leading the charge in terms of quality and all that good stuff, you want to make sure that actually you are leading by example. Um, you yeah. know, we are human at the end of the day, but in terms of kind of beating the path when it comes to quality and making sure that you know the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, then then you really have to kind of take charge. That's kind of certainly my opinion on it. Um, Fortitude 17 doesn't just test Microsoft business applications. You, you'll, I don't know if you'll test anything and everything, but you, it's certainly not the only um, type of application that you'll, you'll offer testing services around. Can you maybe share with us some other stories about other apps you've tested? And I'd love to know how they compare in terms of quality. Is Microsoft great to work with? Is it terrible to work with? Um, I'd love to hear more about what else you do. Oh, okay, very good. Um, so the main solution that we support aside from the Microsoft stack is um, Ceridian's Dayforce HCM. That really came about because um, a prospective client of ours said, okay, I, I understand that you guys are kind of pro Microsoft, if you like, um, you know, and we're a kind of real quiet partner of Microsoft, nothing exciting. But but anyway, we we support, sorry, long story short, this prospective client came to us and said, look, do you support 
day force um it's something we're really considering we you know we are very it's, it's a hr centric software um so we're really considering that at the moment is that something you support so as a business we went away spent a lot of time with ceridian um to understand the system you know thankfully coming on the off the back of a three-year hr um right. top to bottom implementation you know it's it stood me in good stead for understanding I, uh, hr policy and process um so the translation on a technical comparison was very slim you know i will say that i will say that dayforce is probably my favorite software to work with um okay. though not the one i work with most um it's all front end so uh, in terms of testing and things there's no back end you don't have to really worry so much in terms of that everything is really right before your eyes any customizations anything you want to do is really there there to be done in terms of other things gosh this is kind of beyond 12 years now for me i've, I've very much been in the microsoft space and and now uh, day four space for, for that long um i think the last thing i tested prior to that was the open university student inquiry <laughs> website so uh that's that's a long time ago now a little while ago very good um emma i'd love to to share some links to fortitude 17 um and, and your website there which i think you've just uh, launched a new website a, few, uh, a little while ago um, but you've also launched something else you've launched your own podcast recently tell us about that <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, it's uh, as, as we were saying in the kind of preamble, um, it's not quite a patch on this, but thank you very much for bringing it <laughs> to mind. Um, it's, it's something I actually feel quite passionate about. I'm uh, an avid podcast fan. I love to listen to all sorts of stuff, anything that's kind of centric to business or lifestyle. Um, I'm very pro self-development. I'm one of those people. Um, so mm -hmm. I very much love any any podcast that's kind of cool to me in that vein. Uh, but What's yeah, your favorite so podcast at the moment? Oh, that's a killer question. God, that's like asking me what dog I like the most. Um, <laughs> gosh, the ones I listen to the most are um, Stephen Bartlett, the Diary of a CEO. I've I've been a right. fan of that for a good few years. Yeah, prior to Dragon's Den, and yeah, it's um, it it gets some great great guests on there. Um, Mindset Mentor, School of Greatness. I mean, there's a theme here, but um, yeah, Mel, was honest, Mel yeah, Robbins, was good yeah, Mel Robbins, all that kind of stuff um yeah i just um I, I don't listen to very many uh good relaxing podcasts actually it's all pro self-development but uh yeah um my podcast that's it's just been launched it's it's with a nod to fortitude 17 and i like to talk about business and and you know uh testing those are kind of key to who i am but on the flip side of that like i'm also an athlete i also have a whole other side of life and for me, you know, I wanted to kind of step away from Fortitude 17, my baby, my work baby, and, and kind of deliver a podcast that kind of calls to all the things that I am, you know, whether it's sport, whether it's in particular football, whether it's business, um, you know, I hope you'll do me the favor of returning and, and being a feature, a feature on my podcast. I'd, I'd love that. Oh, for sure. That'd be great. Thanks very much. So, and what's your, what's your show called? Um, it's the Albecchio Show. Which the Albecchio is, um, Show yeah it's um it's a funny story my it's a long story short i i climbed kilimanjaro for charity a few years ago and i wrote a blog while i was kind of in in and amongst it for anyone that had donated so as part of fundraising i i committed to writing right. a blog and the albecchio show was the name of it and uh this is albecchio show 2.0 i guess um <laughs> it's yeah, it's really um, something I kind of thought about. That's probably the hardest thing about starting a podcast, picking the right name, I think. So, uh, yeah. And you, you mentioned sport a couple of times. Uh, you're a, a professional footballer, semi-professional footballer. You've, you know, tell us about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, gosh, gladly. Um, as I said, it's really <laughs> kind of the, the other half of the coin for me. Um, yeah, so I've been a professional footballer for as long as I can remember. Um, I've recently come back from playing in Norway um, for the second time and fortunate sure. enough to represent the Republic of Ireland at one point in my life. Um, uh, I was going to say, are you, you're not playing against Brazil in, uh, uh, in a couple of days time? I think England's, England's playing Brazil. You, you play for the Republic of Ireland, is that right? Uh, yes, once upon a time, that's certainly true. Um, I'm in my swan song years now, I'm, I'm sad to say. I'm a big advocate of kind of making the most, certainly of a, a sporting career. I appreciate that it's such a short, you know, stint in your life, considering how long hopefully life is for everyone. Mm. Um, yep. So I'm just trying to maximize it as, as much as I can, you know. Yeah. What do you fancy the chances of the Matildas picking up the World Cup in July? <laughs> 
Oh, um, I have to say, I probably fancy England more to, oh, to kind of beat Australia to that point. I'm, I'm sorry to say. And um, I'm just <laughs> someone that played for Ireland. No, no allegiance to England other than being born here. But uh, yeah, it's um, I've, I've kind of so it's something that I, I very much monitor and keep on on top of women's football. So um, yeah, I, I just have a feeling that um, sadly the Matildas won't fare as well as other teams might. I oh, I don't know. They, they they scored a couple of cracking goals against um, Spain last night or the night before. Um, uh, you know, just absolutely pick it out of the back of the net type um, <laughs> shots, some 20, 30 yards away. So uh, if they keep playing like that, although they left in, they let in a couple of soft goals at the end. But if they can play like that, um, well, we'll see. And uh, hopefully it's a big home advantage. Um, the Women's World Cup has been played across, I think, New Zealand and Australia in July. So. Uh, yeah. Good luck to the Matildas <laughs> for that one. But I think the, the England uh, women's team, European champions at the moment, is that right? Correct, yeah, very good. Yes, yeah. so, um, yeah, it'll take some beating. It'll be a fascinating competition, we'll see. I'll hopefully get some tickets to take my kids along. Very good, yeah. It's, it's certainly something that, I mean, gosh, I think everyone, unless you've been living under a rock, can appreciate that there's been substantial growth, certainly in England, um, in terms of women's football. You know, you, you mentioned the Matildas and there's a nice influx of uh, Aussie girls playing in, in the UK at the moment. Um, but yeah, the the England girls winning the Euros, gosh, it's, it's kind of done nothing. You know, being in UK when it kind of happened, you know, even as a, an Irish player at one point in my life, it's it's incredible you know the the kind of noise around it now it's you know yeah. gosh I, I i'm sure kind of five years ago there's no chance that i'd be on a podcast talking about women's football um so <laughs> the, the growth has been kind of phenomenal and long may it continue yeah well hopefully the sponsorship will follow and then you know some of the incomes to some of the players as well i think it's um there's very few sports maybe tennis is almost there in terms of parity between um the the, the amount of income that that male players can uh, achieve versus female players so i think we've got a long way to go in a lot of sports but uh, it's, it's improving i hope yeah I, I think you're spot on yeah it's and again it's just kind of um in the nicest way it's not it's not really about putting it down everyone's throats it's it's just a kind of about slowly increasing awareness and yeah. again parity is something that i believe will come with time and and again it's it's difficult you know you you kind of weigh up what each prospective sport brings in men versus women in that respect and and it's not comparable at this point However, if you look at opportunities, you know, one little fact that not a lot of people know is that actually women's football in the 1900s was bigger than the men's football. Um, really? You know, yeah. And and actually, you know, long story short, the FA kind of um, stopped women playing football for a, a substantial period of time in the UK. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of on a second resurgence now, if you like. But yeah, um, a little fact that not not too many people know. I did not know that myself. There you go. I learned something today. Well, Emma, thanks very much for joining us on Amazing Applications. It was a pleasure catching up with you and, and learning a lot more about professional testing and what that can bring to our dynamics applications. So I really appreciate you coming on and joining us. My gosh, the, the pleasure was absolutely mine. Thank you so much, Neil. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much.